anymore when I'm called on a signature page. Um, now that she's like, oh, no, she'll just ask me what is the topic of your message. And then I tell her, and then she goes on that. And I don't know how she knew I needed that particular song right there, but I think I've heard it.
I want everybody to turn around and look that way. Look at the back. Count how many empty pews you see. Mm. All right. Now, I want you to look at the pew that you're on. How many people on it? Mm. All right. Keep that to yourself. Ladies, I want you to move up same pew where Deidre is. Here we go. Um, yes. So, you look in the back, I want to read some figures to you all from this website called simplechurchathome.com. As of 2014, these are the following figures. In 1990, 20.4% of North America voters go to church on a regular basis. In 2000, it was 18.7%. In 2005, it was 17.5%. In 2010, it was 16.2%. By 2020, if Jesus doesn't come back, it'll be 14.4%, that's an estimate. By 2050, barring the rapture, it will be 10.7%. You all notice how it's going down? It started at 20.4%, and they're estimating by 2050, it will be 10.7% of people in North America will attend church on a regular basis on Sunday. As of 2008, over 3,500 people leave the church every Sunday, never to return. Over 3,500. Now that was in 08. This is 14. Can you imagine what that number is like now? That statistic was taken in 08, six years ago. Every year, approximately 4,000 new churches open. 4,000 new churches open in North America every year. But every year, Chris, 7,000 clubs. So you got 4,000 that open, and then almost half as many clubs. Now I got a question for you. How many people have joined Greater Faith since you've been a member? Y'all don't count. Y'all don't hear the beginning. Outside of the King family, how many people have joined since you've been a member? How many people have you invited? How many people have you witnessed to? I mean, witness. Not very used to come to church. It's um, catfish fry and chitlin roast going on at the church. You should come so you can get a place. Not that type of witness. I'm talking about witnessed to. How many people? Hmm. Question, how many people have left Great Faith since you've been here? These are questions that you are asking you. Yeah, it's family. We have family conversations. That's what family talks about. Amen? Family is not always the pretty. So today we're going to have some real conversations, some real raw conversations. You're going to get a scripture. You're going to get all of that. But let's ask the questions first. How many have left since you've been here? How many of you have checked on those that left? Since they've been gone, have you talked to anybody that left right away? Did anybody find out why they left? Do you even have their phone number? Have we done our due, due diligence to make sure that we weren't the reason they left? Are we the reason or are we part of the solution? Amen? All right, so we're gonna move through a couple of scriptures. So I, my, my advice is that you write them down and then we will, you can get back to them later. I ask that you do. Uh, the first one is the book of Esther, the fourth chapter, the 15th to the 16th verse. Book of Esther, fourth chapter, 15th to the 16th verse. And the reason why I chose that one is because I want us, this is one of those messages where you ask yourself a question. Was I quiet when I should have spoken up where kingdom is concerned? Where kingdom building, where the kingdom is concerned? Was I quiet when I should have spoken up? The book of Esther, the fourth chapter, 15 through 16 verse says, Esther sent back her answer to Mordecai. Go and get all the Jews living in Susa together. Fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, either day or night. I and my maids will fast with you. If you will do this, I will go to the king, even though it's forbidden. If I die, I die. You all know the story of Esther. She knew what was going on in the kingdom. And then her uncle Mordecai reminded her, don't think 
that the same thing can't happen to you. So she decided to go against the norm and say something. How many of us say something? Where kingdom is concerned, how many of us say something where the ministry is concerned? For the good of the ministry, how many of us raise our hand and say, I have an idea? Or raise our hand and say, well, I don't think that's such a good idea. Or we go to our brother in Christian love and say, I don't think you should have handled it that way. Maybe you should handle it this way. How many of us do it? I'm not talking about people's feelings. I'm talking about the kingdom. We are keeping people from knowing Christ because we are not opening our mouths. We're sitting back and we're being quiet. Now, if you feel a little guilty right now, don't worry about it because I felt the same way when I was doing my study. How many of us just sit back and let the status quo be the status quo? Let me tell you what prompted this message. Because everybody in greater faith works hard, amen? But I think that if we do our due diligence in our kingdom building, we won't have to work as hard because there will be more laborers in the vineyard, amen? So today, let this be the first step in us being introspective and thinking about what we can do to better the kingdom. Next question, was I talking too much when I should have been silent? The scripture for that is 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter. I am reading from the Message Remix Bible. Just want to let you all know that because your version, of course, is going to be different from mine. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 11 through the 12th verse. And the Message Remix reads like this Stay calm, mind your own business. Do your own job. You've all heard this, you've heard all this from us before, but a reminder never hurts. We want you living in a way that will command the respect of outsiders, not lying, lying around, sponging off your friends. The part of that verse that I want you to pay attention to is the first. Stay calm, mind your own business, do your own job. Should, was I talking too much when I should have been silent? How many of us outside of the ministry, just in life, you do something, thing, you think about it, you're like, you know what, if I had mad my own business, I even wouldn't be in the midst of this school group. Am I the only one? Stay calm, mind your own business, do your job. If we all focus on doing the work of the kingdom, instead of the foolishness that we, all some, we, uh, we often find ourselves getting into, think about how much more work you can get done. Think about how many more lives would be committed to Christ. Stay calm, mind your own business, do your own job. Speak, what, everybody, everybody heard the silence is golden? Yeah, this is when it's 24 karat gold. When the work of the kingdom is at hand, let's focus on that first. Mind that business and let God be God and handle everything else. Amen? Amen. The next question I want to get to ask you is, am I arrogant about my salvation? Do you know a lot of times we don't reach people because we're arrogant, because we're saved and they're not, so we tend to look down on them like, oh my God, you're a sinner and I really shouldn't be talking to you. Am I arrogant about my salvation? Let's go to Romans, the 12th chapter and the third verse. Romans 12 and 3. Romans, Romans 12 and 3. All right, we're ready? I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all God has given me, especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it is important that you do not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing his goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. God don't owe you no thanks. Life is a gift. Breathing is a gift. Health 
mental strength is a gift. Mental clarity is a gift. Being able, baby sister, to um, bring others to the kingdom by letting your light so shine is a gift. Guess what? You didn't have to have the light. Let us quit being so arrogant in our salvation. Be humble because you're not perfect. Am I? Hello? Amen? Sometimes we get, um, my girl used to call it, getting too big for your riches. You get so, oh, so heavenly bound that you are no earthly good. That means you got one foot in the kingdom in your golden slipper on the golden path already. And you really don't. Jesus has not come yet. And since some of us who are being so arrogant really don't have a lot to be arrogant about, let's bless God that Jesus didn't come because some of us may stay here. Let's stop being arrogant in our walk. Be humble. You should be able to reach a bomb on the street just like you are able to reach the person sitting next to you. Stop thinking that your salvation is too good and nobody else is deserving of it. Because if Jesus had thought that way about you, bam, where would you be? Next question, am I humble and honest about my imperfections because I am human? Am I humble, am I honest about my imperfections because I am human? Philippians, third chapter, first through 11 verses. Philippians, three. Verses 1 through 11. And that's about it, friends. Be glad in God. I don't mind repeating what I have written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. Better safe than sorry. So here goes. Steer clear of the barking dogs. Who? Steer clear of the barking dogs. Those religious busybodies. All bark and no bite. All they're interested in is appearances. Mm. Life happy circumcisers, I call them. The real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leads to work away at this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do it. We couldn't carry this off by our own efforts, and we know it, even though we can list what many might think are impressive credentials. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church, a meticulous observer of every they set it down in God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dog dumb. I've dumped it all in the trash so I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I can get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way I could get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. Look, Paul had it all. He was degree. He came from a good background. He had money. His people had money. Their people had money. Went to the best schools. He did all of that. And he threw it all away just for the chance to tell somebody else about the kingdom. Because in Christ, your background means nothing. In Christ, how much money you got means nothing. Who you know means nothing. In Christ, all that matters is Christ. I am, mom has her doctorate. I'm working on my master's degree. But in Christ, we're the same people. You're a teacher, an educator. Shandalise is a student. But in Christ, you're the same people. But in Christ, they're the same people. Stop thinking because you got $5 in singles and somebody else only got four quarters that you're better. 
in Christ, you're the same people. You're human, you're imperfect, and your job is to teach others about their ability, even in their humanness, to have Christ and the love of Christ in their heart, amen? We are not doing our job if we think that we are better than somebody else. We're not doing our job if we're talking when we should be silent. We're not doing our job if we are silent when we should be speaking. We're not doing our job if we are arrogant when we should be humble. We are failing at our job. Now, I can say this to greater faith because this is the church, our church body, but the big church, the big C, is failing at its job. Let me tell you who's winning at theirs. The Jehovah Witnesses, who every day come and knock on my door to tell me about Christ. The Jehovah. Who sit in that McDonald's on Bible Farming Place every day with a table with all of their literature laid out on it. And they have 50 million reasons why they should leave here and go to the Kingdom Hall. That's who's winning. Because they have more people coming every day. Guess what? They're part of the 3,500 that are leaving here every Sunday. Guess who else is winning? Mark Miriam over there uh, on the south side. You know why? Because they have standards. But what they do is, they come and they tell you why you're worthy, then they work with you to bring you up to those standards, then they hold you accountable. The church is just so weak and we say, well, God knows my heart and we'll do anything on mealy mouth and then wishy-washy. Then we come at people the wrong way so we hurt their feelings and then they leave and where do they go? To the mosque. You wonder why it's growing? Because we're failing. It's not because Jesus is different. It's us who are foolish. Let's get about the business of kingdom building. If you are not here to be trained to go out and take over for the kingdom, why are you here? For the cafe? You really here for a $2 polish? They got that on every expressway exit. Amen? Last, last, am I following the Great Commission? Matthew 28, 16 through 20. You all should know this because mom and dad say it every Sunday. Meanwhile, the 11 disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain. Jesus had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshiped him. Some, though held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I will be with you as you do this, day after day, right up until the end of the age. Are you following the Great Commission? Who have you gone to go get? Who did you preach to? Who did you teach? Who did you train? I'll answer that question, nobody, because we haven't had Sunday school in about four months. Ain't no training going on, mom and dad are here. How are we equipping ourselves to go out and follow the Great Commission? We can't possibly be following it because we're not preparing ourselves to follow it. You can't come in here on Sunday and think that you will get the same, same in-depth lesson that you would get in Bible study. Because we got enough time on Sundays to give you a hallelujah, three hot points, some scriptures to go with it, and then send you on your way, and then hope that you can maintain and hold on to your salvation until the next Sunday. We're failing. Not only are we doing a disservice to the kingdom, we're doing a disservice to ourselves. We wouldn't have to come up for prayer every Sunday if we were equipping ourselves like we're supposed to. But then let's flip that. If we were equipping ourselves like we're supposed to, then when we turn around and look, there may have been people in the pews because we would know how to go out and do our jobs. Please don't get angry at the message. Well, you can get angry, look at it. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Talk to Jesus. I got mad when he gave it to me because I knew that I had failed. Honor that great commission. 
Go, has anybody gone? Go ye, as the King James Version says, amen? Preach, teach, train, educate, empower, encourage. Who have you encouraged? Who have you empowered? Huh, but who have you talked about? Who have you lied on? Who have you run up out of here? Let's be real with ourselves, everyone, just like Christ is real with us. Because only in being real with ourselves can we stop being the reason and be the solution. Amen? Amen. Let's give God a hand.